We're excited today to have our brother Kevin come and share with us again. Um, you may, may remember, remember, remember here, here back, back in the spring, in the spring that Kevin, Kevin came, and, came spoke and, and spoke with us then and spoke specifically about um, some um, of those some missionaries, missionaries that we get, that we to, get support to support on the, on the other, other side, side of the globe, of the globe um, that we're um, partnered, partnered together, together with. So, so it's exciting, so exciting to hear stories from the field then. But today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different and just continuing our series in First Peter, so we're excited about that. So thanks so much for being here, Kevin. Good to see you. Good morning. So, I was going to start by asking you to pray for the missionaries, but your pastor's got a praying heart, and he just did. So, so I won't, I won't ask you to do that again right now. Um, but I do want to remind you that we actually don't even like to use the word missionaries anymore because it's dangerous. The places that our people go, um, if you say you're a missionary, some of them could then be killed. And uh, so we call them global workers now. And uh, so we would love for you to pray for our global workers, even though we all know they're missionaries, you know. And so um, right now in particular, though, that means we have workers in Israel, in Lebanon. Uh, my friend, my boss, is leaving today for Egypt. We have workers in Egypt. You know, I kind of texted him yesterday and said, you sure you want to do that, dude? You know, like, because uh, it's, it's scary over there. And so we would love for you to pray. Um, but there's an event coming up actually this Friday, and you will get a link for it in your, your midweek uh, newsletter that comes out from College Creek Church. So if you haven't filled out one of those, like, connection-type cards, we'd love for you to do that so you can get that on a regular basis. But um, I owe some of you an apology. The last time I was here, you guys kindly filled out this sheet to, to sign up to pray. And some of you that signed up to pray for Indonesia, there was a communication breakdown in that team. And so I don't think you ever heard from us. So we're fixing that. Um, but as also, some of you have terrible handwriting. But we won't even really get into all, all of that. But, so, um, but here's the thing. This Friday, from 6 p.m. until 6 p.m. the next day, we hope to have about 1,000 people from across the nation and around the world praying for an hour each. So like, how can you get a thousand hours in one day? Well, if you got a thousand different people that would each pray for an hour. And so Ann and I will be on the call. It's a Zoom call. It's just going to be one continuous Zoom call. And the link will, again, be in that newsletter this week. And you could sign up for the hour that's the Spice Islands. You could sign up for the hour that's Israel. You could sign up for the hour that's Togo or, or whichever one you want. Or just pick any time and, and just come join us. We've had people sign up for the whole 24 hours. They're just going to stay awake and, and pray nonstop for, for 24 hours. But um, let me lighten the mood a bit. Um, you know what October is? It's Pastor Appreciation Month. Did you know that? See, see the face? I wish you could all see his face. I can see his face. That was my reaction, too. This thing was first created, Pastor Appreciation Month was first created probably 25 years ago or something. I've been a pastor a long time. And I thought it was sort of like a Hallmark holiday. You know, you know what that is? Like they create holidays just so that they can sell stuff to you. And, you know, and so then, then people started to, like, buy, honestly, I'm just try, I hope this is funny for you, but they started to buy, buy like, spiritual junk for their pastors like this whole month and so like one, one family bought us this little kind of like nativity scene but it had a blue led light in it and so we called it kmart jesus because it was like the blue light special and, and another family gave us this kind of plaque thing that said do everything in prayer and we weren't really paying too close attention but the colors of it kind of matched our bathroom so we put it in the bathroom until somebody pointed out do everything with prayer in the bathroom maybe not the best place for that so so Here's the thing. I hope every month is Pastor Appreciation Month at College Creek Church. Because I really appreciate your pastor, and I hope you do too. He, yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, you heard his prayer just now. I hope you were listening. Uh, I don't know that I've ever met any pastor in my life that has a bigger heart for his community than this pastor has for yours. And so if you want to appreciate him, Here's the thing. Don't go to the Christian buy bookstore and buy him Jesus junk. He doesn't need that. Here's what you could do. You could say, Pastor, what could I do this week or this month for our community? And you would encourage his heart. Or, or you really want to hit a home run with your pastor. Sometime in the next few Sundays, bring somebody with you and say, Pastor, I'd like you to meet my friend that I've invited to College Creek this week. And it will blow his mind, and he'll be happy the rest of the day. So, so that's what you could do for your pastor this month, okay? Anyway, so Isaac, we love you. We all love you. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, what Isaac told you is true. I'm going to actually continue the series that he was doing, and this is, like, really fun for me 
Because usually when I go to a church, I talk about mission stuff because I'm now the missions guy, right? But for 32 years, I wasn't the missions guy. I was the pastor guy. And some of my friends are here. They've heard 2,000 sermons of mine. So you can feel sorry for them if you like. But, <laughs> but, and so, so recently at the church that Ann and my wife is here um, and I led for all those years, um, I got to do this twice in two weeks in a row. And, and so I did a series called Don't Waste Your Life. And what we talked about were sort of signs or biblical ideas that, that, that demonstrate spiritual maturity. And so um, I'm not going to do those two sermons for you today, um, but I want to tell you about them because they kind of relate. The, the first one was don't waste your life on bitterness. So many people, have you noticed, are bitter and angry today. And... and, and Paul calls his, you know, the followers of Jesus to not be like that. We're supposed to be different than other people. In fact, we're supposed to love our enemies. And so here's the, here's the preaching punchline from that sermon. The measure of your spiritual maturity is not just how much you love Jesus, it's how much you love Judas, right? How much are you willing to love the person that doesn't vote like you or look like you or from a different race or have money or doesn't have money or whatever? How much are you willing to love somebody who's really different than you? Because that's the measure of spiritual maturity. But I'll tell you, if we, if we do that, if we become ambassadors of reconciliation, there is joy in that. Um, it's the pathway to joy. There's a second pathway to joy, and it was my second sermon. It came from the verse that launched me into ministry. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, The things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, these you entrust to faithful others who will be able to teach others after that. Right? And so I pour into Isaac. Isaac pours into Sam. And Sam, who, by the way, your worship team is awesome. Uh, you know, Isaac pours into Sam. Sam pours into somebody else. And all of a sudden, Isaac's got grandkids, and he's not even married, you know, because that's the way it works, you know. So, so I, I can just tell you that if you will not just be like a churchgoer, but if you'll become a disciple maker, your life will be full of joy. And so I, I told my church about, you know, men that I discipled years and years ago, and they're still making disciples now. And, and when I see them after all these years, my heart is just full. I texted one of them yesterday from the game saying, you know, wish you were here. I needed some comfort anyway because Air Force was killing us. So anyway, okay, so, um, so then I finished that series with my church. And uh, literally almost as I was driving out of the parking lot, it's like God told me you're not done. You got to have one more sermon in that in that series. So I, I expect to be back there later this year. And and so I'm like, you know, kind of what about? And and it's suffering. See, one of the hallmarks of spiritual maturity is how you respond to the hard times. And then Isaac and I start talking about me coming here this Sunday, and I'm like, well, like, where are you in your series? And he's like, well, you could preach on First Peter chapter four, and you know what it's about? Suffering. So we're going to talk about that today. So I was teasing Isaac, you know, before the service. It's like, all you've given me is to solve the riddle of life's biggest problem, the thing that theologians have been wrestling with for 3,000 years and haven't quite got it all figured out, but Peter knew a lot about it. And so um, if you would turn in your Bibles, I think we, some, yep, we put it up here on the screen, but um, we're going to start with just 1 Peter chapter 4, the first three verses, 12 through 14. So let me go ahead and read those with a little bit of narration along the way, um, and then we'll dig into them a bit at a time. Okay, so um, Peter, by the way, this is kind of near the end of his life. And things were not easy for the followers of Jesus. They never have been. They won't be until he comes back. Um, but he, he, in this section, said, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And that little term in there, fiery trial, you kind of get the sense of it, and you heard from Daniel already this morning, right? I mean, God doesn't always keep us from the really hard stuff. Sometimes really hard stuff comes to all of us. Like really, really hard stuff comes to all of us. I like the coach folks to say, there isn't really anyone who isn't grieving that you know. You'll never meet a person that doesn't have some sadness in their life. Because Here's why. Because we're living on a battlefield. Ann and I have a bunch of friends in Israel right now. And they get this. We'll talk about that more in a minute. 
Let's go back to the text. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes on you. Notice it says to test you. Um, it, it's not like a quiz. That's not what that's talking about. It's like refining you. It, it's, this is how we learn to go deeper into Jesus. It's, it's a crucible kind of moment. Verse 13, So, in so uh, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Okay, he's coming back. When he comes back, no more tears or death or crying or pain. My job is to speed the day when he gets here. You all get to help me, right? So someday it's all going to be fixed. But for now, he says, consider it joy, actually, when you're going through this stuff, which that's, we're going to have to figure that one out. So let's talk some more. Verse 14, so if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Okay, um, let me show you where Peter's going with this. And, and you've been go working through the book, so you already have some of this down. But, but Peter's saying, look, life is hard generally, and then there's these things that happen to followers of Jesus in particular where we become insulted. It becomes not popular to follow Jesus. Welcome to America today, where it's not particularly popular to follow Jesus. Used to be, I was a naval officer, right? So in my 45th class reunion this weekend, I'd love to tell you all about it after service. But it used to be I could walk into any room full of men with my Navy stuff on and I had instant respect. Nowadays, I can walk into any room full of men, say I'm a pastor, and they have no idea what to do with me. It's like, they just don't know what to do. They think they're not allowed to swear, like the old Navy guys never heard those words before, Right? You don't have to take notes because I think this will be pretty memorable. But the first thing that Peter tells us is don't be surprised. Just don't be surprised when hard times come. They're coming. I mean, it's one promise I wish I couldn't make you, but I, it's one a promise I know I could keep. That hard times, if they're not already here, they're coming. Generally speaking, but specifically if you go all in for Jesus, there will be those who are not happy with you. Uh, Jesus' other friend, not Peter, but John in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, you know, I've turned there, said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. The world hates you. I used to joke, I did a lot of work at the Jessup Correctional Institute, and I used to joke that eventually when it becomes illegal in America, like to proclaim the gospel and they put me in prison, at least I have a lot of friends there, right? So I hope they put me in that prison if, if that day ever comes to that. But you know, our friends, Ann and I frequently now over the last couple of weeks have been on Zoom with our friends in Israel. And they always start the Zoom calls with, look, if the sirens go off, we gotta go, you guys just keep praying. You see, they're not surprised now when the sirens go off and the rockets come because they know they're living in a battlefield. Well, friends, that's where you're living too. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, Our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. You are living in a spiritual battlefield until the Lord of heaven's armies comes back and makes everything new. We are going to continue to live in that battlefield for our whole lives. So parents, you're going to raise your kids in a battlefield. It changes the way you think. It changes how you react when the hard times come. Let me go back to verse 14. It says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests on you. You know, because the Holy Spirit lives in those who follow Jesus, um, that bothers some people. Because when good shows up, bad doesn't like it, right? And so, and so you, I want you to have that expectation that from time to time, your very presence is going to bother people because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Um, Ann and I moved into a house in Laurel a while back, you know, a number of years ago, and uh, I met my next door neighbor um, at the fence, literally. We met at the fence, and hi, I'm Kevin. You know, let's call him Joe. That's not his real name. Hey, Joe, nice to meet you, and what do men do? Well, what do you do for a living? Well, what do you do for a living? Well, the minute I said I was a pastor, his face literally turned red. He, he tensed up, and he's like, don't you tell me a thing about your God, and blah, 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 blah. and he just like, Burr. Thankfully, you know, I've been at this a while, and I didn't react like, oh, you terrible person. It's like, no, I, 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 trust me, I won't be shoving Jesus down your throat kind of thing. We, so we, we kind of worked it out that day a bit, 
And then uh, some months later, I, I got a new, to me, not new, but used off a penny saver. Remember penny saver? A new riding lawnmower. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm like ready to mow the whole neighborhood, you know. So I, so I go mow my grass and stuff. And then I, on the front of his lot, because he had a woods and then a house, there was a strip of grass. And so I mowed his grass, because that's what neighbors do, right, where I come from. And then he called me up, and he just chewed me out for mowing his grass like I thought he didn't know how to mow his own grass. Sorry, I'll never mow your grass again, I promise, you know. Um, but, but my wife, who makes the best apple pie in America, um, you know, we just continued to love them. And over time, we saw their hearts soften. Now, uh, they're not followers of Jesus yet. Not, they've moved to Florida. But uh, we shouldn't be surprised when this stuff happens. You can go towards people in the name of Jesus, with the love of Jesus, with the food that your church gives away and all that stuff, and still don't expect that everybody's just going to say, aren't those Christians sweet? Because that's just not the way it always works. Let's go back to the text and go to the next couple of verses. Verse 15 says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a, a meddler. And one of the other translations as a troublesome meddler. Now, that's hardly new stuff, right? Like God doesn't want you to be a murderer or a thief or, you know, just a bad person or kind of somebody who's sticking their nose in other people's business. That's not exactly revolutionary stuff. But why would he put that there after what he just said? I think the answer is that when people come at us, when we're in hard times, Hebrews 3 would say when we are discouraged, we become vulnerable to the deceitfulness of sin. See, when you're in the midst of suffering, it's easy to go to places that you otherwise wouldn't go. Why is your community rife with addiction? Because people want to anesthetize the pain away, but they make choices to fill the gaps where the suffering is with, with, with stuff that they think will take away the pain. It just won't. It just makes it worse. So Peter goes on to say, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in that time. In the, I mean, sorry, in his name, verse 17. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and it begins with us. And what will be the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel of God? And then he ends this part with, if the righteous are scarcely saved, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Okay, here's a second memorable line for you. What, he, what Peter's really saying here is, look, in the midst of your suffering, even though life is hard, don't be a jerk. Okay, you might want to write that down in case you can't remember that. Don't, don't be a jerk. What he's saying is, look, when it, when it becomes hard, you're going to be tempted to go to places that you, you don't really want to go. And, and God, since he's your loving Heavenly Father, he will discipline you. Now, we don't have time this morning to unpack what happens in terms of judgment for Christians versus non-Christians. Let me give you the super abbreviated, incredibly short version. For followers of Jesus, we will not be judged because God will remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. But what does happen at what's called the judgment seat of Christ, you can read about it in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 1, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5. What happens there is that we get rewarded. And so if in the midst of our suffering we go down a dark place, we're forfeiting our reward and we're forfeiting our joy. So I have to come here this morning and say, that's a bad idea, right? Now for the, for the person who doesn't choose to follow Jesus, for the person who rejects God, they go to what's called the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, and you definitely don't want to be there. So if you're here this morning and you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus, I just need to remind you, he wants to forgive you. He wants to give you a whole new life and set your life in a completely different direction so that you'll go to a place where, where there is no judgment, where there's only reward. That, that's what he offers to you, and you can decide to follow him this morning just by telling him you need him and asking him to take over as the Lord of your life, okay? Um, but let me come back to the text. There, there's something that we really want you to keep in mind um, because you talked about it in, in chapter three. I'm sure Isaac talked to you about it. You see, in chapter three, you were told that we are to be ready to give an account for the hope that we have. Okay, so in the midst of our suffering, we still have hope. Because we know that Jesus is going to fix it one day. No, there's nothing this world can take from you that Jesus can't restore and that won't, he won't restore. 
All that's been taken will be restored. He promises that at the restoration of all things. So 1 Peter chapter 3 says, we have to be ready to give an account for the hope that's in us, and we're to do that with gentleness and reverence. Okay, so here's what Peter's saying through the course of these two chapters. Look, hard times are going to come, so don't be surprised. But don't be a jerk. Let me add a little extra. Because people are watching. Mm -hmm. People are watching how we handle this. Let me tell you a true story. Even though I'm not here to do the missions thing, I'll tell you a mission story, okay? In Senegal. You know where Senegal is? It's the farther western part of Africa. It's where my favorite monkey lives. I'll show you his, his picture later if you want me to. I got it on my phone. Okay, so in this land with really cute monkeys, it's really dark there spiritually. The Wolof people are a Muslim people group and, and, and they're very far from God and they're very violent and it's just a rough, corrupt place. There's a lot of corruption in the government and, and so on, okay? And so there's a Muslim man who's come to faith in Jesus. So we would call him a Muslim background believer, okay? And so he's now ministering in hospitals and all kinds of places. And so he was in a taxi one day and the taxi's going down the road and they come to a checkpoint which is basically a government bribe station where you gotta stop and pay the man, okay? And so they're, they're coming up to this and the taxi guy sees the checkpoint and veers off the road, goes down a side road, goes down that way and, and comes back out on the main road further down the road. Only problem is the cops saw him, so they pull him over down the road and they say, hey, why were you trying to avoid us? And he said, oh, I was making a delivery over there, you know, and he just spins this lie. But our Muslim background believer guy's in the back seat of the cab. So the cop comes to him and says, is that what really happened? And he said, no, sir, it's not. And he tells the truth. Now here's the punchline of the story. And then the cop goes, you know, I know who you are. I've been watching you. You're a Christian, and I was just wondering if you were going to live up to what you say you believe in. Mm. Boom! He did, Right? I'm telling you that story to say people are watching. People are watching. And when they see those who love God not give up and not give in, when it gets hard, they want that. When I first came to faith in Jesus in 1972, some people showed up at my church and gave their testimonies. I'm excited you're going to have testimony night. They gave their testimonies, and I looked at them, and I heard their stories of all they'd been through, and uh, I just lost my dad about a year before that. And uh, I'm like, man, whatever they got, I got to get that. Because <laughs> I knew that my going to church all my life wasn't giving me what they had. And so that's how I decided to follow Jesus, by hearing people tell their stories of how God had taken them through some stuff and brought them out on the other side. So we got one more verse. And I think it's the most important verse in the passage. So if you look at me at verse 19. Because this is the answer that we've all been waiting for. In the midst of your suffering, Peter says this, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will, which means they're suffering because they're doing those good things, right? That's why, that's why it's God's will. They're in the midst of engaging this battle between good and evil. The, those who suffer according to God's will, here it is, they will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while they're doing that good. If you only remember one word that I say today, here's the word I'd love for you to remember. It's the word entrust. It's one of my favorite words in the scriptures. I actually quoted it to you earlier. It was in my favorite verse, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that you've heard me say, these you entrust to faithful men who, can get, uh, who will teach others also. So uh, in this verse, this simple little verse, here's what I think God is saying to us this morning. Don't give up. <laughs> Instead, give it up <laughs> and give it out. Let me show you what I mean. I'll say it in bigger words. When inevitable suffering comes, I'm going, to I'm going to choose to entrust, we'll talk about this word, I'm going to choose to entrust the deepest part of who I am to my heavenly Father and to you. Let me show you what, where that comes from in the text. So Peter is saying, look, you're going to be suffering, right? Therefore, those who suffer, we're going to be suffering. What he asked them to do 
He's going to ask them to entrust their souls. That's the deepest part of who you are to who? To their faithful creator, to their Abba Father. When you're in the midst of the dark times, and we will all be there, we've been there, I'm going to choose in that moment to say, God, I'm still going to trust you no matter what. No, no matter what has come my way. And through the course of my life, some things have come my way. I lost my dad when I was 12. I lost two grandparents soon after that. We could go on and on with lots of stories. Peter knew about this, right? He, he'd already started to lose people. He'd been through suffering. And so, so this verse really has, has two parts. And the first part is we're to, in the midst of our suffering, choose to entrust the deepest part of ourselves to God. Here's why. Because God is not surprised at your suffering. And he's still good. In the midst of our suffering, we still have to declare first to ourselves and then to anyone who's watching that we know that God is still good. See, I, I thought about saying to Isaac, can I not preach your passage and preach 2 Corinthians chapter 1 instead? Because the best commentary I know on 1 Peter chapter 4 is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read you a couple of verses from there. You see, uh, Paul wrote this. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. When we actually say, God, I'm going to take whatever this junk is that I'm going through and I'm going to choose to trust in your goodness no matter what in this situation, what we find is comfort and mercy. And Philippians 4 was the first verse I ever memorized where it says that we can have a peace that's beyond our ability to understand. I can't explain this part of it to you. I can just tell you it's absolutely true. When you're in the midst of suffering and you entrust the deepest part of yourself to a heavenly father who actually cared so much that he would send his only son to die in your place, somehow peace comes that's beyond our ability to understand. Bob and Val are here with Ann and I today. Some of our dearest friends, Rick and Laura, lost their 24-year-old son a, a few years ago. He, he was like a son to all of us as well. He was the funniest person who ever lived on the planet. And when we stood in front of our congregation to celebrate Jason's life, and Laura, his mom, got up and sang a song of praise to God, the rest of us were just in awe. But how could that happen? How could you sing glory to God when you've just lost your son? Well, because there's this supernatural thing that happens to people who suffer when they choose to say, God, I don't like it, I don't get it, I don't understand, but you're still good, and so I'm going to trust you anyway. And in that moment, I just tell you, listen to the old guy, there is a peace that passes our ability to understand that comes from the very heart of God to the heart of those whose hearts are breaking let me read a couple more parts of this thing. You see, we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so, Christ, uh, so through Christ, we share abundantly in his comfort as well. Many verses later in verse 20, it says, For all of the promises of God are yes in Jesus. And his promise is that to the brokenhearted, he can give a peace that's beyond our ability to understand. Ann and I went through a really difficult season. When I got Lyme disease, I got sick. Our church got sick. We're not going to give you that, that whole story. But, but, but there were moments when I was literally on the couch so sick and then like anxiety and mental fog and all this, this craziness. And uh, it, it, it was just really hard. And uh, in that moment, God took me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where I've been talking to you. Because there's this lie that's out there, perhaps you've heard it, it goes like this, God will never give you more than you can handle. How many of you have heard that? Some of you heard that? Any of you ever said that? Okay, never say that again. Because that is a lie from the pit of hell, that's a pile of crap, okay? Um, the old pastor can say these words, all right? There's things that come in our lives all the time that we can't handle. The Apostle Paul said he despaired to the point of death, that it was overwhelming. But then he said, God, allow this to happen that I might learn to depend on him and not on myself. That's, that's the key part of that thing. But then he said, and then God will deliver me as you help me with your prayers. See, this is two parts to this verse. Now we finally get back to 1 Peter 4.19. I said it was the best verse in this paragraph. Let's go back to it. Let Therefore, those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Here's the second part. While they're doing good. 
Here's what that means. God, I'm going to trust you no matter what, da, 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 but I'm going to still keep talking to these guys too. We've got to learn how to play while hurt. Kenny Pickens, quarterback for Pittsburgh Steelers. That's my team. A week ago, he had a bum knee. They didn't know if he was going to play until he ran 28 yards in one play. He learned to play hurt, right? We all got to play hurt in this game on the battlefield. You can't just stop. You can't just quit. So we want to keep making disciples. Because if I go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, you know, the comfort that we've received will give us the, com to the capacity to comfort others in any affliction. Let me tell you a story about my sainted mother. So we lost my dad when I was 12. He had been sick for eight years with Lou Gehrig's disease. A couple years later, I was standing at my mom's side in a funeral home because another one of my classmates had just lost her dad. And here's my mom comforting her mother. And I hear my mom saying words like, God never makes a mistake. And if somebody else had said that, it would ring like, you know, kind of spiritual, you know, blah. But, but my mom had been through it. My mom had suffered the loss of her husband. And so she was able to comfort her friend in a way that I never could. Because thank God I never lost my spouse. Right? When, when you've been through some stuff, you have the capacity to comfort other people when they're going through some stuff. If you've trusted God through that thing and found his peace that's beyond our ability to understand. College creatures, there is no more powerful thing that you can bring to this community than the comfort and mercy of God. As you go through your stuff and you learn to depend on him, you can carry that with you out into this broken world and it will make a difference. And I want to end with this reality and there's no greater way that you can do that than through your prayers. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, at the end of that section, Paul specifically says, we, we will make it through to the other side as you help us with your prayers. When I was in that dark time with Lyme disease and that whole mess, there was a guy that I had discipled. His name is Bob Rivera, and uh, he didn't come to our church anymore because he'd moved to Northern Virginia. But he just started to get all of his friends to pray for me. And at one point, I got a call one evening from a church in Florida saying I was on their prayer list. And I'm like, okay, I don't know how that happened. Eventually, I figured out it was Bob. Somehow knew somebody who knew somebody who knew this church really prayed. And so they were, it, I mean, my soul was just lifted that night to know that people were praying for me. And so we'd love to have you, you know, obviously this week pray for our, our global workers. Remember, we're not calling them missionaries anymore. We'd, lo we'd love for you to lift their hearts that way. Um, but you can do that for each other. Final thought. Don't say, I'll pray for you. Say this instead. Can I pray for you right now? See, here's my gift to College Creek Church this morning. <laughs> When you see that someone's suffering, don't wait. Don't promise to pray for them. Just say, can I pray for you right now? I often, as a pastor, have been called to the hospital to visit. Let's say if Isaac was sick, you know, I would go to the hospital to be with Isaac. But when you're there, you tend to bump into other people. And I bumped into Jewish people, and I bumped into Hindu people, and I bumped into atheist people, and I bumped into all kinds of people. And they tell me what's going on with their family member who's in the ER or whatever. And I say, can I pray for you right now? 40 years of this, I've never had someone say no. You, people want you to call out to God because they're, they're going through some stuff. And, and, and they desperately need this one who can bring peace that's beyond our ability to understand. So don't be surprised that we all suffer. But don't be a jerk in the midst of it, right? Choose. I'm going to entrust myself to God and ask him for that peace that's beyond our ability to understand. And then even in the midst of it, I'm still going to be looking for how I can give away. But please don't be too proud to let someone give to you as well. So I'm going to pray for you, but when I'm done and the service is done, you might be here this morning and needing somebody to pray for you. I promise you, there's a whole bunch of people sitting around you, <laughs> including the four of us and Isaac and the leaders of your church. We'd love to pray for you this morning. You can just come up to us, let us know you need prayer. We would love to pray for you when this is all through. Okay, let me pray right now. 
Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that there is peace that's beyond our ability to understand. And we are so grateful that one day we won't need to ask you for it anymore. God, that when the gospel goes to every nation, tongue, and tribe, and Jesus, you come back, you've promised that you will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more tears or death or crying or pain. But God, we know when that's happening. And so until that day, I just want to pray for anyone who is here this morning, who in the deepest part of who they are needs to cry out to you now and say, I know that you're good, but it really hurts. God, would you just make them especially aware that you love them. Make them especially aware in this moment that you understand. And God, would you bring to them that Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, peace that's beyond our ability to understand as you guard their heart and as you guard their mind through Christ Jesus. And Lord, we do pray for College Creek Church as they go forward into this community that they love. And God, we pray that they would be ambassadors of comfort and of mercy. We pray that they would become disciple makers who learn to not only look up, but to look out and, and, and give away all that you've been teaching them. So Lord, we know that you've called this church uh, into existence for this very community, for your purposes, and we're just really grateful for that. We love you, Jesus. Uh, we pray this in your holy and powerful name. Amen.